So what we'll do, you will uh, make a presentation and then we'll have a, um, some moments for questions in the mm -hmm. end. Yeah, okay. And, okay, uh, so you're welcome, Mugen. Yeah, and thank you very much uh, for the kind um, introduction, first of all. And I'm really very happy uh, um, and thankful to the organizers, to Margareta Tengberg and Marjan Mashkur for their invitation to us uh, in order to um, uh, represent the results of our archaeobotanical research at the Ordinaeotic Ashiklahuyuk um, from uh, mm -hmm. Cappadocia, Central Anatolia. Yeah. Uh, this is a site that gives us a great opportunity to explore truly the beginnings of uh, agriculture and sedentary life in this part of the world. And uh, this paper is partially based on my PhD research. Uh, as Margareta mentioned, uh, I did this as a joint PhD program with her uh, in the museum and with George Wilcox and with Mirban Özbaşeran uh, in Istanbul University. So I had examined the macrobotanical remains in order to assess different aspects of early farming life and its adoption process by this academic Neolithic community who lived uh, in the Cappadocian steppes. Uh, approximately 10,500 years ago. And uh, of course, with the new excavations, there is more recent archaeobotanical record that we obtained. And with this presentation, we would like to uh, give an overview of these blended results to you. Hopefully, all is working well, <laughs> by the way. And now, um, Firstly, we are going to have a short introduction to the Anatolian, uh, Central Anatolian context and a more detailed introduction to the site. Following this will be the research aims and questions, the materials and methods that include sampling and recovery strategies. And finally, we will focus on the results on different plant uh, components and compositions throughout the occupation of the site, with a uh, main focus on food plants. And finally, we will highlight some important points and discussions, and hopefully later we can discuss all together. Um, so Central Anatolia, as uh, you might know, is a large high plateau uh, surrounded by uh, volcan um, my mountains from all sides. And even today's catastrophic human impact on the environment rivers, lakes, marshes, alluvial funds, terraces, sand dunes, and volcanic landforms really create a diverse, diverse um, microecological niche across the region for different plants and animals to uh, live in. And South Lake to the north and Konya Plain to the south are the main enclosed basins. The central Anatolian volcanic province extends to the east and southeast and uh, encompass the volcanic lands of Cappadocia, which are rich in obsidian resources, as you can see on the right side, uh, some of the pictures uh, from these resources. And the red point uh, on the map is where Ashiklahuk locates. Based on uh, pollen analysis from Ajigöl, central Anatolia was generally more humid and better irrigated than today during the onset of Holocene and steps with a high density of grasses increased at that time, and open woodland vegetation expanded, although slower compared to the other side uh, parts of Southwest Asia. And uh, just briefly, in the his archaeological history research, no, sorry, in the history of archaeological research in Turkey, Central Anatolia initially was considered um, unsuitable for settlement during Neolithic, on account of its climatic conditions. But as you know, in 50s and 60s, with uh, James Mellars and Ian Todd's surveys and the following excavations that, of course, would include Çatalhöyük and later on Işıklıhöyük, this point of view changed. And today, thanks to the growing evidence coming from surveys and excavations from both areas, um, Central Anatolia is now regarded as a geographic region within the social and ecological landscapes of Southwest Asia for the emergence of Neolithic way of life and more specifically the transition from foraging to food production that eventually led to the development of farming communities. And research further indicates, especially on archaeobotanical data, that such changes did not occur homogeneously and at once 
there were local dynamics and processes involved, as in the case of um, Central Anatolia. So this region was attractive to humans throughout the prehistory. Mobile foragers exploited the obsidian resources in volcanic Cappadocia. And we know that this material distributed to destinations in the Levant, Syria, and Cyprus. And such distribution continued throughout the early Holocene. Even though still limited, the evidence from uh, Konya Plain and latest research from volcanic Cappadocia indicate that local epipaleolithic communities, mobile forager groups, lived in this region. And they made uh, use of caves, rock shelters, and uh, like higher lands and different water resources. But by the 9th millennium BC, we start to see some forager groups uh, focusing more on sedentary way of living by permanent water sources on lower lands. And uh, our knowledge on the 9th millennium is still also scarce, even though growing. And here on the map, you see Ashit uh, It's one of the few earliest settlements known from uh, Central Anatolia, dating back to mid 9th millennium BCE. And in a way, it's unique, uh, given its characteristic of being a um, one period mound that was inhabited almost for a thousand years without any interruption in its sequence. And Ashitli inhabitants, uh, of course, chose the location of their site close to the volcanic mountain ranges and obsidian resources and the diversity I had just mentioned. But also, they benefited from the riverine environment. Today, as you can see in the pictures, there is Melendez River just um, by the side of them, uh, by Ashikla. Uh, and so they, we know that they had access to open woodlands in this tepic uh, area, and uh, grasslands and woodlands were, of course, closer to the settlement uh, than they are today. Here you see that uh, there are many agricultural fields, so the landscape is mainly uh, shaped by humans today, of course. The river known uh, as Melandis was there at the time of the occupation and eroded away at some point the western part of the mount, uh, leaving us in a way a nice profile where we can see the changes and the in a way story of the settlement. And you can see that profile on the left side of the picture and the side plan. So the initial excavations, I would like to mention, of course, these, um, that they started in 1989 as a rescue plan because there was a dam construction in the vicinity. And the scope was to ex excavate the site extensively. However, in 2000s, it became clear that the water would not reach to the area and um, the site was safe. And the new um, research project uh, initiated in 2010 under the directorship of uh, Mihriban Özbaşaran and an Istanbul team and other international uh, groups. And uh, the focus was on understanding the earlier cultural periods and the diachronic and horizontal patterns on social, economical and cultural life ways by bringing together different techniques and scientific and humanistic approaches. At the end, five cultural levels have been attested, with the surface layer, level one, almost entirely destroyed due to the modern agricultural activities. And in this presentation, we are going to focus on the ninth millennium that encompasses level five, four, and three, and the eighth millennium settlement uh, from level two. Ashikluyuk is the earliest major aggregated village settlement in central Anatolia that formed towards the later stages of the occupation and cons consisted of densely packed buildings. However, it had a different character at the beginning, at the initial um, periods. And research indicates that throughout the occupation for almost a thousand years, Ashikli inhabitants experienced important changes in their life ways. Uh, I won't be able to mention all these changes um, but uh, one of the major ones is in architecture and settlement layout. In level five, uh, which represents the initial stage of sedentism, buildings consisted of woodland dock structures, which were semi-subterranean and round in plan, and sunk deep into the ground. There were also above-ground structures made of wood and reeds. 
And level four and three represent a permanent settlement consisting of more durable oval semi-subterranean buildings made of uh, sun-dried carpet blocks and mortar. And external spaces between them were used for different uh, daily activities. Some structures in rectangular shape also started to emerge. And in level three, with the population growth, there's uh, a density at the site, um, which we see uh, increasing. And uh, a semi-subterranean building distinct in size and internal features also designed for communal use at this period. And finally, level two, the eight millennium settlement seems more like an extended and crowded village consisting of rectangular mud brick houses. And we see a variation in house uh, structure and possibly use, uh, possibly reflecting different functions. Some houses had one room and a small addition, others had um, more than two rooms. And at the late, uh, towards the latest uh, phases of this settlement, we can see that the um, site was divided into a dwelling area and a special purpose building area where collective activities again took place, such as feasting. Overall, the community became more settled and crowded throughout the occupation. And another change we need to emphasize is the people-animal interactions. So um, a shift from broad spectrum foraging strategy to caprim management uh, occurred from nine to eight millennium settlements. And Steiner et al. also defined different stages that indicated a local domestication process, including broad spectrum and catch and grow strategies uh, that uh, evolved to small scale caprim reproduction and capture of wild infants in level three. And, Later on, large scale herding economy with low level wild infant capture. So putting all these together, uh, I try, um, try to give a background for the site. And of course now about people plant interactions. So in such a site, what archaeobotanical research uh, tell us and what sort of questions we need to ask also. But first, I would like to emphasize uh, the previous archaeobotanical research at the site, which was conducted by Van Zeiss and their roller. And they mainly focused on the 8 millennium settlement, so during the rescue excavation period. And our aim with the new research project at the site has been to understand the earlier levels and evaluate the diachronic and spatial patterns on plant um, use, so mainly plant-based subsistence strategies, of course, gathering practices and food production, as well as understanding various plant-related activities within the site and around in the surrounding, and their effects on the social and cultural aspects of life. And finally, assess the environmental setting, human environment interactions, and that would also include the human impact on the environment uh, through uh, exploitation and uh, field uh, land use by plant cultivation. So our methodology, in order to uh, fill uh, the gaps related to these research questions, of course, we needed to have a um, well, methodology um, um, designed, and that's why uh, we apply the systematic sampling at the site, taking uh, samples from each uh, well-defined excavation unit, and we extracted plant remains using mechanical flotation. Most of our plant material is preserved, are preserved by carbonization, in other terms, by charring. But there are also some taxa that we find uh, preserved by minerals, mineralization. Finally, we follow the principle of minimum number of uh, items for counting, which will be a detail for uh, archaeobotanists, I guess, but I still wanted to put. And um, the results we present here are based on 158 archaeobotanical samples which more meaningful would be saying like based on 17 buildings, structures and 22 external areas, activity areas. Um, so uh, before going to the results, um, I would like to mention of course also some important points uh, regarding the assemblage. So first of all, the earliest level five and level three uh, have been excavated in limited areas due to 
the topography of the mounds. So we relatively have less um, samples from these levels. So a new context, especially from these levels, uh, would affect, will change, or would um, support enrich our results in the future, hopefully. And secondly, the preservation conditions are not even across the levels. So we find more burned context uh, in early levels five and four, and especially compared to level two, which seem to be like uh, buildings are cleaned more regularly maybe, but uh, except from the hearts, which also seem relatively clean, we don't find many burned uh, contexts, which uh, probably also create a bias on the preservation of the archaeobotanical material. Um, so these are our results, but this is um, a classification that we did for this presentation. There are a um, few categories. Uh, we are going to talk first about the food plants that uh, include cereals, pulses, nuts and fruits, and wild plants. And later mention some of other wild taxa, which uh, we uh, have the understanding that they were important for the Ashikli community. And in the assemblage, Mm, sorry, there are also dung and caprolite remains and some amorphous remains, which um, sometimes really can be uh, classified as food residues, like trans uh, transformed uh, food remains. But we are not going to talk about those due to the limited time. Starting with cereals, we have attested um, glue wheat, free threshing wheat, and barley, so three main categories. As you can see on the pie chart, glue weeds predominate the cereal assemblage. They also occur almost in each sample. If you look at the table showing the ubiquity of each group, uh, you could see that they are very widespread. Although free threshing weed and barley are low in proportions, like less than 10%, they are also quite widespread in the assemblage, especially the former one, the free threshing weed. Here you see the details of the major uh, cereal type, the gloom weeds. They are mostly present by their chaff and less with their grain, meaning that they uh, mainly represent byproducts or discards of cereal processing. 60% of the gloom weeds are indeterminate, so it wasn't possible to identify them into species level. However, among the identifiable ones, emmer seems to be the most predominant. New gloom wheat, which is now considered within the Timofevi group after the ancient DNA uh, analysis um, by Shvaskovska et al. and Badeva et al. Um, it's the second common type at Ashiklavik. And so far, Ashikla uh, provides the earliest evidence for this wheat species. Finally, einkorn, as you can see in uh, red color, is very, very low in proportions. And following from that, uh, we can emphasize another early finding at Ashiklavik, free threshing or so-called naked wheat. These uh, wheat types have different ear morphology and they, uh, they have a different shattering mechanisms, as you can see on the drawing on the right. Um, so this strategy allowed the grain to release more easily. And in fact, they are the types that evolved under uh, plant cultivation practices. So in the wild, they wouldn't uh, appear by themselves like that. Um, it's, um, and it is very striking that they occur in such an early Neolithic settlement dating to PPMB, middle PPMB. Even though they occur in small proportions, as mentioned before, they are quite common in the assemblage, mainly represented by rachis internals, again, um, pointing out to cereal processing residues, and rarely by their grains. So Van Zeiss and their other have previously identified naked wheat from uh, level two and evaluated them as a probable primitive type and closer to durum, uh, in other terms, hard wheat. In our work, we have similar concerns and difficulties to make precise identifications. And therefore, at least so far, we define them as uh, tetraploid slash hexaploid. So hard wheat slash bread wheat. Um, and the least abundant cereal type in the assemblage, as I mentioned, uh, is barley. Rakes internals are also more common in this cereal type compared to grains. And except the inde indeterminate remains, which are also proportionally quite high, 
there are two forms uh, and hull types which are identified. And generally we can say that two row barley is the mo most common um, barley type. Of course, uh, we've been talking about changes through time. So we will focus on the diachronic changes. And I think um, here we can see that uh, there is a pattern going on in different serial types. Uh, for example, all types are present, present since the beginning of the settlement from level five to two. And uh, if we put aside the indeterminate gloom wheat, which is dark in uh, green color, we can see that emmer is the predominant one since the beginning of the settlement and throughout the segments. However, I would like to highlight like that. Um, however, um, free threshing wheat and from level four onwards, barley increased through time in proportions. And new gloom wheat uh, has more or less same proportions throughout the sequence, as well as einkorn, which maybe we can say slightly becomes more visible in level two. This brings out the question whether cereals different than emmer, such as free threshing wheat and barley, started to be selected, seen differently by the inhabitants and selected and maybe cultivated as separate crops by the late ninth millennium, so level three, and throughout the eighth millennium, level two settlements. Another diachronic pattern we can observe is the proportions on the wild shattering and domesticated non-shattering forms of gloom weeds. Here, uh, we also added uh, the terminal spikelets, which you see at the bottom um, of the slide. Um, maybe they are not very representative uh, for uh, the eyes of non-archaeobotanists, um, but uh, they are important because um, their increase might, in, um, might indicate that there is an increase in domesticated forms because normally these are the uh, terminals or so the top uh, spikelets on a serial ear. And in the wild times, they would be the, one of the first ones to disarticulate and just shatter and reach to the ground for uh, sown themselves for the next year. Uh, so in domestic forms, these stay in the ear. So if there's an increase, uh, that would mean something. But as you can see in the graphs, uh, the blue, um, vivid blue color terminal doesn't change from level five to two, or it's more or less the same in terms of proportions. Another thing uh, is uh, the dark color represents the indeterminate one. So uh, as you can guess, like most of these uh, gloom weeds are not identifiable. We can say if they are domestic or wild, but what we can uh, see among them, the very small proportion, we can see uh, that there's a constant mixture of wild and domesticated forms uh, at Ashitla. And domesticated forms are more ab abundant in level five and four. And there seems to be a shift in the favor of wild forms in level three, so this one. But uh, the, uh, the same is valid for level two. Despite a slight increase in domesticated time, still we see uh, a lot of wild uh, forms. So we can, talk, we can mention a fluctuating or irregular pattern, which can be related to hum, uh, human practices such as continuous input of populations gathered from the wild or other landscape environment related uh, reasons. For instance, the Sweetville soils by the river might become limited. So somehow the wild populations would be more favored in repeatedly, um, not, uh, repeatedly uh, cultivated lands and so on. So these are still uh, the questions we are exploring further. And comparing the wild and domesticated forms of barley, we see a slightly different pattern because there's an increase in the wild forms in level four, but it seems like domesticated types occur more abundantly in later levels, especially in the eighth millennium BCE settlement. So there is a trend towards more domesticated types. Uh, leaving the serial world, we will focus on the pulses now. Um, there are, there are at least four pulses, big legumes uh, attested at the assemblage, lentil, bitter wedge, pea, and chickpea. We can only find the seeds of pulses in the samples. So uh, the pots, as you would know, like these are the parts um, that we remove in order to reach the seed. 
They would be the byproducts or discard material and can be hardly preserved by charring as opposed to serial cleaning residues. As you can see on the graph, 47% of the panserines are unidentifiable, mostly because their surfaces uh, are eroded. So we don't force for, um, the identification further. And among the identifiable ones, lentil is the most predominant, followed by bitter wedge. Both are also the most common types um, in the assemblage, as you can see from the ubiquity uh, table. Pian, especially chickpea, appear in very low proportions, and uh, they are the least common ones. And when we look at the changes through time, we see that lentil is far the predominant type in the earliest occupation. And interestingly, chickpea only occurs in level five, uh, not in the other levels. Uh, by time, proportions of lentils decrease, and among the identifiable ones, uh, bitter wedge becomes more abundant, especially in level two in the mid eight millennium settlement. We think this change is significant, uh, especially when we look at the natural distribution habitats of these taxa. Lentil is not a, a local central Anatolian plant uh, based on today's distributions. However, bitter wedge uh, naturally grows more abundantly in central Anatolian uh, region based on Zohari's uh, work. And um, this brings out the question whether there was a tendency for choosing more local a more local pulse type a plant. Another possibility we also consider is a bitter wedge used as fodder plant, uh, nowadays at least, or in the near uh, past it was used for cow and sheep. So could this have triggered its preference by the inhabitants since there was an increasing uh, caprine management at the site? This is a question. Or some ecological conditions might also be relevant for this change, such as the uh, condition of poor soils, uh, which um, bitter wedge are, would be more resilient. Now we are going to focus on nuts, fruits, and wild plant taxa found at Ashikla. Um, so among them, we have identified hackberry, which preserved by biomineralization. Here on the picture, you will see that it's, it looks very different than the charred material. And apart from that, there's pistachio and at least two types of almonds. Uh, Communis is the sweet almond, and orientalis is one that we still find around Ashiklu. It's a very small uh, almond, like a bush type almond. And there's also a large category for less identifiable uh, thick remains that we call almond slash plum remains. As you can see on the pie chart, Saltis is predominant in the assemblage. However, it is worth to note that the fruit stones of this taxon, since they don't need to be charred for preservation, they are more advantageous in a way than the other um, charred plants or plants that can survive through charring. And they can be found more in archaeological depositions. So this is something that we always keep in mind while we are interpreting the data. And pistachio is the second more abundant type, followed by almond and plums. And very few amounts of rubus uh, in the recent years have been identified in the assemblage. Oops, sorry. Hackberries, even though uh, today they are neglected, have many different uses, including both the fruit and branches. Their fruits are very sweet and can be eaten dried or fresh. And um, traditionally, there are different ways of using it, um, including juices and marmalades. And in any case, they are very important uh, source of sugar. And pistachio and almonds, other than their taste and fulfilling characters, they are very nutritional and fatty, as you would probably know. So all these types seem to have been important for Ashikli inhabitants. And when we look at the diachronic pattern, we see that there's an increase in hackberry and a general decrease in pistachio uh, remains. However, as aforementioned, this might be related to preservation biases. Almonds have more or less uh, the same proportions throughout all levels. Um, in the assemblage, nut and fruit remains are mostly uh, preserved in fragments, which might be related to preservation, but also it might be related to different food processing activities applied by the inhabitants. 
especially pistachio and almonds could have been used for oil extraction. And also, uh, as you will, you might know, some almonds require um, pre, um, pre processing uh, in order to pre processing prior to consumption in order to um, extract the irritant and their toxic content. So we usually find nuts and fruits remains uh, in these conditions in fragments and in hearts and external fireplaces, which support their consumption as food plants. But also we find them on floors of buildings and external activity areas, which potentially indicate a sort of um, discard material. Although rarely, nuts and fruits, like in this example, can occur in high concentrations in relation to uh, well-defined archaeological context, or they can help us to define an archaeological context. Uh, so you see that um, on the floor of a burned and collapsed bottle and dub structure from level five, uh, in two locations, we found high concentrations of hackberry fruit stones. The majority of them were whole, as you can see on the far right um, of the slide, there are two small pictures. We think that they were stored in this location within the structure, which is also supported by uh, phytoliths and soil chemistry analysis. And uh, leaving this um, nuts, uh, nut gr fruits groups, again, now we are looking to another uh, plant category, wild plants, which we can define uh, this group, particular group as herbaceous plants. Uh, they are quite varied at Ashikla, um, but wild grasses, especially small seeded poesian and other wild grass, uh, Tiniaterum caput medusae, dominate this group. In addition to their high numbers, they are also very widespread. You can see the ubiquiti, they almost occur in each sample. In total, more or less, uh, we have identified 80 taxa. Uh, and some of them uh, are plants that live in uh, mainly stepic um, habitats and others in other dry land uh, conditions. And there are few wetland and aquatic plants. And uh, as you know, uh, wild plants can represent very different uh, human related practices and choices, such as gathered food. Uh, for their fuel or uh, plants used for different purposes or wheat flora that uh, is harvested with uh, uh, cultivated crops and brought to the settlement unintentionally. And they can also come with dung pellets or <clears throat> some other sorts of caprolite remains. Um, being aware of this complexity, we suggest that at least some of the wild taxa <clears throat> can be part of the plants that were gathered and consumed by the community. These are poppy, camelina, which are rich in nutrition and medus. <clears throat> I'm sorry, just. So these are poppy, camelina, which are rich in nutrition. <clears throat> and there is also medusa headgrass, uh, the one that I had just mentioned, uh, tinea terum. These are the um, uh, types that we think they can be part of the consumption, food uh, consumption. And Medusa had mainly known as a fodder nowadays uh, from some parts of the world at least, and or a wild grass that grows naturally by itself. And so far it has no traditional use in Central Anatolia that I could find out, I could, uh, we could attest it. But it's a middle-sized grass, which can be considered with uh, nutritional values. And the last two, so poppy and uh, camelina, have been found in external area from level five, uh, which was heavily burned also. And they occur in great concentrations together with some amorphous food residues and shaped food remains and rodent pellets, which indicate an um, instruction for at least these uh, animals. Uh, and overall, the evidence combined with the archaeological context, we have interpreted this area as an external activity space where possible food preparation took place. Another example of plant concentration is of medusa head grass again. So thousands of remains have been detected in the same woodland dot uh, burn structure where hackberry concentrations were found. But uh, in another part of the floor, they, uh, this grass occurs. 
And uh, both grains and chaff um, of this grass were mixed together in the sample. But as you can see from the numbers, the grains were far more abundant, indicating possibly a processed and cleaned product. So accordingly, we think that a sort of plant processing activity and potentially a short-term storage practice took place in uh, here in this part of the building. The latter uh, possibility is also supported by the soil chemistry analysis. And finally, when we look at the diachronic patterns of these uh, taxa, we see that poppy and camelina are more present, represented in the earliest level five. However, the concentrations we have just talked about were found in this level and effective proportional results. Therefore, their representation in smaller proportions in level uh, four, three, and two do not necessarily mean they were not collected and consumed by the inhabitants in these levels. The lack of in-situ burned context, especially in level two, might also add a bias to this graph, to this picture. Uh, and uh, medusa grass seem to be present in all levels, as you can see in the graph. The specimen is mainly represented by its chaff. This is very likely indicating a processing of this grass um, in which its chaff became to be a discard and deposited in the archaeological context. Since poppy and camelina do not have uh, such discard material which can survive charring like its capsules or um, pots, it's possible that this also creates a bias in their uh, presentation in later levels. Now, uh, as I mentioned, we are going to uh, look through some plants which uh, were used. We know we suggest that they were used by the inhabitants for other reasons than food. One of them is verbascum, uh, represented in the assemblage both by its seeds and capsules. The latter is the structure that holds the seed. And we majorly find them in context related to fire use, such as hearts and external fire um, places, and also in floors and activity places. Verbascum traditionally have many uses, as you can see some of them here. We think that at Ashikle, they were at least used as fuel or kindly material and throughout the occupation. It's still possible to find this saxon around Ashikurik, and we also tried them uh, on, the, our, on the hearts of the buildings in the experimental Ashikurik village. And they burn easily and very nicely. They leave a very nice smell. And another plant is the Phragmitis, which so far we have mainly identified it by its calm nodes, which you can see on the lower right side um, of the slide, the dark color, the chart uh, calm nodes. They also occur in hearts and fireplaces, but also in the samples coming from building floors and external areas. The stems traditionally used for manufacturing of mats, baskets, and roofing. And Ashikli people uh, seem to collect and use them for similar purposes, which is also supported uh, by the phytolith analysis. We have, uh, we find several um, uh, remains, uh, phytolith remains of, of baskets made of these, uh, Plants. And also sometimes they are in relation to burial, used in relation to burial practices. So, um, oops, does it move? Oh, ah, yeah. So finally, after all these uh, results and the data, uh, we can emphasize that Ashikli inhabitants were engaged with uh, their diverse environment and explored the landscape and different ecological zones around them. They were familiar with the diversity within the environment. Archaeobotanical remains, including the results on wood charcoal, dominated by old pistachio as well as repairing plants, also, so far, uh, reflect the appreciation of this diversity. In addition to gathering and foraging, plant cultivation was also practiced since the beginning of the occupation of Ashikla and continued for a thousand years, possibly on the lower terraces on the valley they settled in. So at the beginning, plant cultivation seemed to be a low level food production practice that was part of the broad spectrum subsistence strategies, which included a variety of nuts, fruits, and wild plants, as well as cereals and um, pulses. 
As you can see on the graph, cereals and pencils only represent 30% of the assemblage at, the, at that time in a ninth millennium settlement. On the other hand, eight millennium settlement indicates an increase on crops, mainly on cereals, which we interpret as an increasing focus on plant cultivation. And plant parts, uh, which are highlighted here in green, in level uh, two, uh, they are more abundant, mainly consist of reed cone nodes that um, we cannot say that they also increase in time. This brings out the question whether more cultural material made of reeds were necessary for practices involving food processing and storage in later occupation. So far, we haven't mentioned much about the storage facilities, but there is a change in such practices too between the ninth and eighth millennium settlements. In the ninth millennium, baskets seem to be used inside the buildings for small scale storage, possibly put in the pits, as you can see in the picture highlighted. There are also signs of storage in external areas, which might indicate a more shared or collective nature of storage such as uh, for super household uses. These are questions that we are exploring and working on still. On the other hand, by the eighth millennium, we start to see um, uh, more buildings with compartments that clearly used for storage. Um, in accordance with that, there are also changes in some food processing equipment from nine to eight millennium. Grinding stones, uh, for instance, become bigger and less mobile in level two. And we also start seeing more varieties, which altogether shows um, an increase on uh, food processing. Overall, it's possible to argue that there is an increase in food production at the site throughout the occupation, more specifically in relation to cultivated crops. So what does this mean? Does such focus on agricultural practices imply that by the end of the occupation, an established farming community emerged? Of course, there are some key points to answer, such uh, as the scale and nature of agriculture at the site. But with the current archaeobotanical data and um, through a more holistic uh, point of view at the site, our answer to this question would be no, mainly because there is a constant mixture of wild and domestic forms of cereals, which might still indicate a practice different than what we would expect from an established farming community. And we do not yet observe household-based uh, established systematic storage practices. But uh, a focus on production, which probably affected the internal dynamics and social organization is evident and entangled with the increasing sedentism, which by time led to the emergence of a central Anatolian village life. This can be defined as a gradual and slow cha change in a sense, some characteristics also of Ashikla also continues to reflect in later sites uh, from the region, such as uh, Çatalhöyük, Canasan, and so on. And from more agronomic aspects, we can ask the question whether there are stories for each cultivated species at Ashikla, or when do they start having their individual stories? Such as for emmer wheat, it's not a local plant that would grow in the wild in central Anatolia, as far as we know from the um, natural distribution today. So therefore, together with lentil, which um, has the same um, um, condition, we consider uh, emmer and lentil as part of an introduced plant uh, group, which was chosen and cultivated by the local community. And also new gloom wheat, we see so far uh, that the earliest evidence uh, for this type comes from Ashikla, but it doesn't appear like a separate cultivated crop as it does, uh, it becomes later at Çatalhöyük. And naked wheat, it appears as part of the wheat diversity at Ashikla, representing the start of another story which we need to explore further. And overall, Ashikla, we can say that it's a very important settlement due to its early dates and findings related to plant cultivation and domestication process. Ashikla also provides us with the opportunity to follow different aspects and stages of the evolutionary transition to sedentary life and food production in a local scale, which eventually does not indicate a linear, but rather an organic dynamic pattern with possible ups and downs and maybe even rights and lefts in a way compatible with the um, nature of neolithization process that uh, we see in the vast and diverse 
region of uh, Southwest Asia. And finally, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I hope I didn't talk too much. <laughs>